The oceans of our planet are an incredible resource. For millennia, people have depended on these seas for our livelihoods. No other region in the world matches Asia for its marine biodiversity. A nursery for some 3,000 marine species. But man's hunger for fish is too great and growing too fast. It's midday in the oceans off the Philippines. A yellowfin tuna takes a hook. From the moment it's put on sale at a local market, its price keeps increasing. Six hours later, it is on a plane to America. Within 36 hours, it's on display in a San Francisco restaurant. Its market value, now hundreds of dollars. Our desire for seafood is exacting a deadly price. The potential cost, a world without fishing. This is the most diverse marine region on the planet, a nursery for the seas. The Coral Triangle spans a six million square kilometer area from Indonesia to the Solomon Islands. Here live 75% of the world's coral species and some 3,000 marine fish species. It is also becoming one of the biggest sources of fish for consumers across the world. The tourist paradise of Bali lies within the Coral Triangle. Dr. Lida Petsuda leads the WWF project for the Coral Triangle. For 10 years, the WWF Indonesian team has fought to protect Indonesia's reefs. Every species here plays a crucial role in maintaining the health and productivity of marine food chains. This area holds six of the world's seven marine turtle species. Some marine turtles migrate across the entire Pacific Ocean, more than one third of the way around the world. Globally, scientists estimate some 30 million tons of bycatch result from industrial fishing. With some 200,000 loggerheads and 50,000 leatherbacks caught by commercial longline fisheries. In the Pacific, 98% of the nesting female leatherback turtle population has disappeared in the last 30 years. Five years ago, the Bali Turtle Conservation and Education Center was established. Working closely with WWF, they are trying to educate local fishermen and traders about the dangers they pose to the species. In Indonesia alone, some 7,000 turtles are killed every year by accidental catch. This green turtle was brought in by a local and nursed back to health. Today it will be released back into the wild. The key to reducing bycatch is incredibly simple, but fishermen need to be taught. So with hooks like these that are used uh, on the tuna fisheries, the, the turtle actually eats the bait and it swallows the whole hook with the bait. So while it's then trying to get off the hook, it does a lot of damage to its tummy and uh, very often it actually dies because of that or it cannot eat anymore. So we actually want the tuna fisheries to use these type of hooks. You can see that uh, the shape is very different. The sharp point is, is going inside. And even while the turtles may swallow the bait and this hook, when it tries to come off, it doesn't do that damage that the, uh, the other hooks are doing to the tummy. Almost all of them uh, survive, they're fine. The transmitter is attached. The battery will run for about a year. Every time that the turtle takes a breath, this uh, will send a signal to the satellites. So with that information, we, we are much better able to understand where these animals migrate which areas are critical for these animals in their life cycle, where they mate, where they feed, where they rest. 
In five years, this center has successfully released more than 5,000 turtles back into the oceans of Indonesia. You know, I have a lot of mixed feelings now here with this turtle on the beach. It's great that we can let it go, that it's healthy, but I'm really worried it's just going to swim right into the next fishing net, actually. The transmitter is going to give us really important data. That data is going to help us help these turtles to do a much better job and protect them. So I hope it's going to, it's going to keep swimming. There, there it goes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well done. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Super. But it's a small glimmer of hope in a region in crisis. Man's demand for fish is pushing these reefs to the brink. I think that a lot of people are not realizing how serious overfishing and also illegal fishing is today. I think a lot of people are maybe too far removed from where this is happening. This area here within the Coral Triangle is actually one of the most important areas that we can still protect. For centuries, the seas have fed and sustained Asia. In Indonesia alone, over 63 million rely on the fishing industry for their livelihoods. But today, foreign buyers will take anything and everything for eating or display in aquariums. The result? Poor fishermen will use any means to catch live fish. The most effective method? Cyanide. These corals should be a safe area for young fish and spawn, but none are safe. All are collected for sale. They are destined for transport ships hidden offshore, part of a giant global illegal trading system. So there's these Hong Kong boats, they come here every month and uh, they come into this place, take all the fish and leave from here and that's, that's illegal. Normally if you export fish from Indonesia, you should report how much you take out, where you're taking it to and also where, where it's come from. So these boats come in, take however many fish, nobody knows, they take it out and, that, and that's unreported fisheries. So it makes it really hard to manage this industry. The business is highly secretive, but an exporter, Hiru Punomo, with links to the fishermen, helps Lita gain access to their work. It's a rare chance to examine the fish at source before they disappear into the market. So if you look at this fish, you actually see a lot of the evidence that this was caught with cyanide. You start with the eye. It's, uh, it's completely damaged, it is, it's a milky eye, you can't see anything with that anymore. And then if you look real carefully, you see that the skin is sort of scarred, like it was burned. You can see the movement with this fish, the cyanide fish is very different. Yeah, they're still very stunned, yeah. they're tra tra tranquilized, right? Yeah. And then uh, after two or three days, it will be died and then with the broken skin, blind eyes and then you know, so bad. For every fish that makes it to Hong Kong, there's a lot of death fish and reefs. You know, corals are, are dead from the cyanides that stay behind. So the impact of this industry is actually really large. So there's also, you know, big impacts on the divers, on the fishermen that do this actually. So the way they dive, staying underwater for long periods of time, going up and down, chasing after these fish with hookahs, but also actually, you know, taking in the cyanides that is all around them the whole time they're fishing, makes that a lot of these fishermen have health diseases. Uh, they got diver diseases. Some of them can't walk anymore. And, uh, and it, it's actually really a big impact on the fishermen themselves. Species like the lionfish can fetch more than 50 US dollars at retail. Leader follows the fish to analyze the scale of the trade. Well, he says he has a lot of fish today. Jadi senang hari ini. So he's quite happy. Wow, looks like a lot. The global trade is worth some 278 million US dollars a year. 
Southeast Asia supplies up to 85%. America imports the most, 60% of all marine ornamental fish. There's a couple of uh, expensive ones. Ada yang berharga ya, Pak, di dalam sini juga. Ada. Yeah. yeah, he does have a couple of valuable species. This is a... Uh, it's a lionfish. There's a lot of different species here. A couple of angelfish, fairly small. Then uh, we see uh, two Nemo, clownfish. And you can actually see these come in pairs. They really belong together. And uh, so it's really important that they are, you know, going to be staying together all the way to the United States because all of these fish are, uh, are exported into the U.S. Wow, that's a lot of fish. I haven't seen that before. So many of these bags have just one fish, but some of the bigger bags have at least 10. You can see them from here. I see so many fish that are going out here tomorrow, and probably many more from the companies next door. I really wonder how sustainable this is. Sure looks like a lot of fish. The trade is vast. At retail, a kilo of aquarium fish can reach 1,800 US dollars, over 100 times the price of fish that we eat. But many of these fish will die during transport or soon after from the sodium cyanide. I'm really worried. If I see what our oceans are producing for all of us today, that's a lot already. People who are eating seafood, people who are choosing you know, what they're going to have for dinner tonight or what they're going to have in the restaurants, they, they are very much part of the solution too. The global demand for fish is growing. The Asia-Pacific region now catches and sells 48% of the total global production of fish. China is the driving force, consuming everything the seas can provide. The demand for seafood, the demand for fish is only going up. It's, it's going up every day. And I don't think that the oceans can, you know, can support that. The reality is, capture is at its maximum potential in many areas. Nature has no more to give. Thailand is the world's third largest fish commodities exporter, but its own stocks are severely depleted. Right now in the Thai water, during the last decades, I believe that the, our catch has been decreased for at least um, half of what we used to be able to catch. The fishermen have to go further and further into the international water. When the fisherman goes out to fish, nobody actually controls the species. China alone takes in some 17 million tons a year. Hong Kong is heavily overfished. We have no sustainable fisheries management here. And some of the species that we know used to be very common in Hong Kong, they're virtually extinct now. I mean, we really are talking about being close to extinction. And Japan's hunger for bluefin is a major factor in a 90% decrease in stocks of the fish. 15, 20 years ago, there seemed to be more fish than we could actually market and sell. Scientists are predicting some tuna stocks are in danger of commercial extinction in our lifetime. Now there's more market than fish we could sell. The major problem I see with uh, illegal fishing or types of uh, overfishing is too many people, too many boats catching the fish. 13 of the world's 17 main fisheries face serious decline. The Gulf of Thailand, the waters of Southeast Asia, the North Sea, the Mediterranean, Australia, the Grand Banks and the Baltic are all in crisis. Scientists warn that if fishing is not regulated, many fish stocks may never recover. In the last 20 years, reported global marine catch has stagnated at some 85 million tons a year. It hides a darker truth. 75% of fisheries are already fully exploited or overfished. In Indonesia's coastal villages, both poverty and greed drive fishermen to destructive methods of fishing. The black market, cyanide and explosives are literally tearing Indonesia's reefs apart.
Potassium nitrate bombs rupture the fish's swim bladder. Coral polyps, young fish and spawn are all killed by the blast. Some 60% of marine species depend on these reefs. The calcium carbonate coral skeletons are destroyed, making long-term recovery unlikely. Without these reefs, there will be no fish. If a link in the food chain is broken, all the species in these oceans will be affected. Illegal fishing methods alone might not destroy a stable ecosystem, but combined with climate change, they can lead to almost total breakdown of coastal areas. Indonesia holds 15% of the world's coral reefs, but some 65% are classed as damaged. Across Indonesia, vital fisheries resources are dying. Lida Petsuda is tracking the changes across the reefs. The Coral Triangle's health is vital to man. Without it, millions will lose a source of work and food. Wow, that is something else altogether. My God. Each reef tells its own story and how likely it is to recover. This reef is almost completely dead. There are some large pieces of dead coral, but most of it is tiny pieces of rubble. I don't see any fish here. Everything is dead. Do you see? There's a piece of fishing net. Somebody has thrown this overboard and dragged it through the ocean for a while. And now it's entangled around this coral colony. And this coral has completely died underneath. I can't even get it off anymore. was something very different. I mean, if there's no coral on this reef, there's not going to be any fish. It's going to be dead and empty forever. That's pretty sad. Hiru Ponomo is one of Indonesia's biggest reef fish exporters shipping 50% of the country's annual live reef fish from his base in Bali. It's an industry worth over $5 million, most of it supplying China. Today, one of his boats is back from a month's run across the islands. The cargo is coral trout, one of the most popular delicacies in Asia. This ship just uh, arrived in Bali, and normally we send 20 ships for months from all around Indonesia. This boat carried 2,100 kilos for fish and then 500 kilos for lobster. And tomorrow we just send all of this fish and lobster to Hong Kong and China. Hero is fighting to stop destructive fishing. He buys only hook and line caught or farmed fish, refusing juveniles or cyanide caught species. We have to work in fast because we should check the oxygen, we should check the temperature and then we should check all the process. All have to be in a good condition. It takes the whole process from here to Hong Kong for 12 hours. He runs a pristine operation, but he fears the fish will run out as a result of the illegal market. And there are many fishermen in Indonesia that are poor and in debt to buyers who reject sustainable practices that cut into profits. The fishermen are left with few options. And corrupt local officials turn a blind eye to illegal exports. 
Lida and Hiru join forces to try to persuade the fishermen of Indonesia to stop destructive fishing. So how long have you been here? Three days. Really? Hiru's weapon is the scale of his business. He sources fish from all over the archipelago, paying over 10,000 fishermen. He's trying to cut out the foreign buyers on the black market by offering the fishermen training, supplies, and higher prices. 15 tahun yang lalu sampai sekarang, ya, kita ingin merubah apa yang kami kerjakan di laut, sejenisnya punya potasium atau yeah. pengemboman. Hero is starting to have success. More and more fishermen are starting to come to him with their catch. But the odds are stacked against him. When I am alone work, work in this system, I think it's going very slow. Indonesia is a very large place. I cannot work alone. If we do it right and then we do it together, I think this business will have a good future. Not only for us, but also for the country, also for the fishermen, and also for the, for the, the other traders. They will have a good opportunity in this business. I think seven traders in Indonesia, and he's the only one that is really trying to make a difference. He is very significant. I think he does about half of what leaves Indonesia in terms of these type of fish for this type of industry. But he's also just one guy trying to change things. And uh, looking at what we've seen today, especially in this place, I think uh, it will be very difficult for him you know, to change this industry around. Indonesia's fisheries and marine officers are on the front lines of the war for Indonesia's natural resources. Indonesia is very important to win this war because Indonesia is actually the fourth uh, largest producers of fish in the world. Uh, and then we supply or export the fish to many countries, to America, to European country, to Japan, to Asia. So therefore, if uh, we are lose the war, and then uh, the fish will gone. Ya, jadi hari ini kita akan berangkat dalam rangka melaksanakan tugas yang telah ditugaskan negara untuk kita dalam rangka pengawasan sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan. Selamat sore. For 20 days a month, they hunt Indonesian waters for illegal fishing vessels. Tonight, they head out for an extended patrol of the Natuna Sea. The Natuna archipelago is at the front lines in this war. 272 sparsely populated islands are scattered across this vast section of the South China Sea. This is a prime fisheries resource and a perfect hiding ground for thousands of illegal boats. In the 1980s, trawling was banned in many Indonesian waters due to falling fish stocks. But in Indonesia, corrupt local authorities issue illegal permits, making legal licensing a joke. Illegal fishing costs Indonesia some $2 billion annually. Now, patrol leader Samson is fighting back. He relies on local informants to find the foreign boat's rough locations. Illegal fishing. Di plotting berapa mil? Dari jarak sekarang diperkirakan sekitar 120 kan? 120, oke. Okay. Yeah, okay. Kita memang sering melakukan patroli ini dan kita sangat kecewa sekali melihat uh, banyaknya do, tidak ada dokumennya kapal-kapal tersebut yang dikatakan illegal fishing. Saya sebagai bangsa Indonesia ini sedih sekali karena mungkin suatu saat cucu-cucu saya yang ada di Negara ini hanya dapat melihat gambar, tetapi tidak melihat bentuk aslinya lagi. The next morning, fishing conditions are good. The area is full of boats. Ini lari terus nih, jalan terus kapalnya nih. Hey, go stop engine, stay, go stop engine. Engine stop, engine stop. The patrol takes no chances. Other encounters have resulted in armed battles. Foreign companies invest in faster vessels, detection equipment, 
and weapons to avoid arrest. Often they outgun and outrun the patrols. But this time, the target is an old vessel. Take off, anti stop, anti stop, stop it to me. The captain panics and refuses to stop. Warning rounds through the wheelhouse bring the vessel to a halt. Vietnam's boats lead the illegal fishing in Indonesian waters. They take no precautions. Many illegal boats carry weapons and fight back. Four boats are close by. The next one is boarded. Again, it is Vietnamese. The crew has no passports. The boats carry out-of-date documentation. It's cheaper for the owners to lose a boat than worry about permits. Itu kapal ya tadi baru habis kita tangkap. Jadi kita rencana akan kita uh, kita biarkan dulu karena persyarat keterbatasan personil. Jadi kita apungkan di sana. Uh, nanti setelah semua kita tangkap 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 semua kita lumpuhkan, baru kita ambil lagi ini kapal ini. Nanti baru kita sampai kita ambil, baru kita bawa. Jadi orang-orang yang sudah diamankan itu satu kapal lagi tuh. Uh, nanti ya delay lagi. In less than three hours, three ships are seized. One boat reveals the damage to these oceans. The deck is packed with rotting fish, removed from the seas indiscriminately. Unfit for human consumption, to be ground up as fish meal. Ya, tadi kita udah ada tiga kapal di belakang. Sekarang kita itu kapal kita akan lupukan lagi. Terpantau di radar, ini kurang lebih hampir 20 kapal. 20 kapal lebih. Nah, baru kita lumpuhkan ada tiga kapal. Jadi masih ada sekitar 17 kapal yang belum kita lumpuhkan ini. Melawat Adi. Siap siap. Ah, udah ada ada ada. Oke, udah dilumpuhkan. Siap siap siap. Another boat is seized. Every man checked for weapons. In less than a day, eight ships have been captured. These fishermen are likely destined for a long wait in an immigration cell before their government pays for a ticket home. The boats are rounded up. Samson wants to teach the owners a lesson. Each boat is worth thousands of dollars. Usually, boats are auctioned off by the Indonesian authorities, the owners buying them back at a tiny price. But not this time. The crew sets them alight. Samson believes it's the only way to warn the other owners off. Ini kita baru uh, laksanakan seperti begini. Ini kita laksanakan seperti begini supaya illegal fishing ada efek jerahnya. Tapi kalau tidak, kita tetap kita lakukan seperti ini. Jadi kita musnahkan satu persatu, satu persatu. Ya, jadi kita musnahkan satu persatu. Uh, kita harapan ke depannya illegal fishing tidak ada di Indonesia. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Yeah. Demonya dengan teman yang sana. Yang Nanti ini semua, ya, men, ya. Bot, go Thailand, Vietnam, Vietnam ya, go Vietnam ya. Nanti pulang bawa ini ya, Vietnam, oke? Okay? Ah, Vietnam, tidak boleh ada di sini lagi, no Indonesia. Rather than arrest them and leave them in an immigration cell, Samson gives the crew a chance. Oke okay, ya, Vietnam ya, go ya, Vietnam, Vietnam, dadah. Go, 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 Vietnam, go. Ini ya udah semua aja lah.
The patrol sets them free on two remaining boats to try to make it back home. It's a tiny victory in a war being waged across Asia. Bluefin tuna is an amazing species, warm-blooded, navigating thousands of miles at speeds of up to 70 kilometers an hour. Tuna catches from the high seas have doubled to nearly 4 million tons a year in the last 30 years. Attempts are being made to farm it, but its unique qualities mean it is ill-suited to captivity. And if six billion people today are consuming everything the oceans can provide, what will happen as the world's population increases? The high seas are owned by no one, ruled by multinational agreements that are hard to enforce. WWF warns that breeding stocks of Atlantic bluefin tuna will be gone from the Mediterranean in three years, and that failure to implement controls in the Pacific will seal the fate of the Pacific bluefin tuna. 58% of the planet's tuna is caught in the Pacific. Juveniles of many tuna species are found in the Philippines, but they're highly migratory. In the southern Philippines, most people survive off the tuna trade. General Santos City is known as the tuna capital of the Philippines. Philippines tuna production used to rank fourth in the world, averaging 500,000 tons in 2006. But two years later, the Philippines ranked seventh. And catches have continued to drop some 20% a year. In this town, more than 100,000 people are dependent on the tuna industry. In the last few years, there have been layoffs. Tuna is the lifeblood of this city, and it's draining fast. Nelia Ramada has worked the tables in this canning factory since she was 19. Uh, ito ang ano lang namin yung nalalaman ng hanap buhay talaga, yung mga nisya, yung nagtatrabaho ng kanin. Yun lang ano, mga tatrabaho ng mga tao dito. Kasi yung ano, yung kanin, yun ang ano namin comfortable sa mga mga babae at saka lalaki. Yung mas madaling pumasok doon. Kaysa ibang ano, mahirap. Nelia lives in fear that the industry is in terminal decline. In Asia, families depend on the fishing industry not just for jobs, but also for their basic protein needs. If the fish disappear, they will lose the very food they eat. The town's nickname now seems a cruel joke. Nelia's husband is a tuna fisherman, absent from home for months on end. Oo naman, nag-uuhuri kami kasi yung ano, yung unang umalis, hindi nga minsan na yung malayo ang asawa ko. Iniisip ko, kung magsama kami, kung walang trabaho, paano na ang pamilya namin? Tinitiis niya talaga kasi tinitingnan niya yung mga anak niya. Kasi mag-aaral yun. Paano ang buhay namin? Wala kami pera. Sana ang kinukuha yung pera sa asawa ko. Her husband Danilo's work on a Persane vessel is the difference between poverty and starvation. With four children to feed, Nelia and Danilo need tuna stocks to rebound. Sa pag-alis mo, kailangan mag-iingat ka doon sa laot. Kailangan yung ano mo, aayusin mo yung katawan mo, saka yung pagkain mo. In Pacific waters, global warming is affecting ocean currents. Larger fish are migrating from Philippine waters. And the ones left are juveniles, killed before they reach breeding age.
Scientists now believe that fishing for big eye, yellowfin and skipjack here is no longer economically viable. To find the tuna, the boats now travel further and for longer. Ano ba ano kay gagi ano man ako ang kalisod gud di ko ana moingon sila nga lisod man day moingon nga amahan nga awang anak ka nganong gitugutan mao nang mupugong ko sa ila kay lisod ang panagat kay layo kas pamilya nimo na ka sa malayo nya na kas laod din mo mabalan ang panahon Dinalo's vessel uses burst sane nets each boat capable of holding some 150 tons of fish. 40 years ago, there were only 15 large vessels in this region. Today, over 200 vessels compete in these waters for the tuna. Now, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission has imposed a two-year ban on purse seine fishing in the tuna-rich Western Pacific International waters. It means the boats must fish illegally or stick to local waters and smaller, less profitable species. Pahonong mo yun, ipa-ista pong yun ang fishing, basta yung anong makuhanan niya, gamay na lang ang isda sa dagat. Pahonong po ng trabaho sa mga tao. Scientists claim local fishermen are making things worse by their reliance on fish aggregating devices. In a marine environment, fish are attracted to floating objects. These buoys act as a lure to the smaller fish. When the nets close, they take the young fish and destroy the breeding cycles. Then, they're predators, the larger pelagic species, such as sharks and tuna. One solution is sustainable fishing, using hook and line. Rex Gino Diola fishes with a hand line. He does not require a commercial license like the larger boats but it means he cannot go far from shore and must find a fish each trip. The costs for a boat, fuel, line and hooks must be paid. Catch or no catch. Rex's father has always fished these waters. In the past, they'd catch some 30 a month. Now, some weeks, they catch three to four tuna. Some weeks, nothing. This is their reward. A yellow fin tuna. The yellow fin is capable of diving to over 1,000 meters. One of the largest tuna species, it can reach weights of over 300 pounds. Yellowfin is popular, especially as sashimi. It must be rushed to market for sale. The fresher, the better the price. Tuna is now the second most popular seafood in the USA. 
In just four decades, our consumption of fish has nearly doubled. Scarcity of tuna directly affects everyone here. Competition for fish is fiercer every day. But the fish are getting fewer. Rex hopes his tuna is good enough for export. His tuna catches the eye of American John Heights, one of the biggest buyers in the area. It's 52 kilos, we'll try to buy it. Uh, I'll grade it. I'm a guanaco, tuso canaco, dos treinta kilo, I'm a class A. Sagot ka? So I agreed to check the fish and we'll pay 230 pesos, around four and a half dollars, almost five dollars per kilo if it's a good quality fish. First, John probes the tuna to check the fat and flesh of the fish. Okay. Okay, this is a good fish. We'll buy this one, grade A, for five dollars. Rex is lucky. One day has brought his team just over 200 US dollars worth. 56-year-old John Heights is at the docks every day by 6 a.m. He and other buyers must scramble for the few quality yellowfin brought in. Okay, they made the deal, so let's see what we got. Let's try these two. We're Each fish is gutted, tagged, and carefully packed in a cool box. There's a nice fish. The precious cargoes will be on a U.S. sushi counter in less than 48 hours. Zero degrees, this will be good enough to uh, ship directly to the United States today. But John has noticed a worrying pattern. General Santos lives and dies by tuna. But you can't negotiate with nature. The fish can't breed fast enough. And the catch quality is changing. These are small tuna that were caught by the big boats in uh, outside of Philippine waters. Well, as far as whether these fish should be caught or not, they're still small. They're still, I would consider juveniles. They haven't spawned yet. So my personal opinion is they shouldn't be caught yet. Since 2009 and into 2010, and I've been involved in fishing for about 25 years. This is the worst catch that I have seen as far as volume goes and as far as quality goes. Things can be turned around if we start implementing some common sense issues. Per se, net fishing does not necessarily have to be banned. It's not totally bad guys. It can catch a lot of fish, feed a lot of people, but net sizes have to be regulated. If those things are followed, this can be a, a quite a prolific fisheries for many years to come. But if they aren't followed, it will most definitely crash. Contact vessel on my port bow. This is Bureau of Fisheries Patrol Gunboat. We are directing you to stop. Globally, illegal fishing is worth up to $9 billion a year. In the Philippines, over $1 million US dollars alone. Prepare boarding team. Despite the ban, Hundreds of Chinese, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, and Indonesian boats fish these waters freely. Against them, the 14 boats of the Philippine Fisheries Ministry. 14 boats for an exclusive economic zone of over 2 million square kilometers. Often with not enough petrol to leave the port. Their target, a vessel they suspect is carrying no permits. Glenn Padro leads the interception. A cursory sweep proves them right. What we are looking for here is the commercial fishing vessel license, which is a permit to fish, to operate a fishing vessel. We have just checked for their documents, and it seems they don't have a commercial fishing vessel license. Almost all of these fishermen right now here are illegal, uh, meaning to say they don't have with them uh, 
fishermen's licenses which are required in Philippine regulations. So most probably their employers uh, didn't uh, get a fishermen's licenses for all of them because they're very dependent on their employers. Padro knows the boat owners don't care. Corrupt officials means they may never pay the fines, but the crew can be fined up to $200 or two to six months in jail, enough to destroy a family. What we need now is more boats. Uh, we only have three boats at the moment here in Mindanao. We need double, or maybe triple that. And we need more manpower. In our office alone, I'm the only one fishery law enforcer. We have to stop illegal fishing, we have to do more. Across Asia, from the Philippines to Indonesia, the stakes are rising. The battle for the reefs and species of the Coral Triangle affects us all. Species here will not survive unless they are given refuges in marine protected areas where man's actions are controlled. WWF helped to establish this marine protected area in Bali's National Park 14 years ago. A popular tourist site and revenue earner, the corals were badly bleached in 1998 due to global warming. Destructive fishing ravaged what was left. It's been 10 years. Leader is back to assess the evidence of the habitat's recovery. But there's something missing. There's simply been a lot of fishing in the last couple of years. The big reef fish that are missing out of this ecosystem, they've been fished out. There's heavy pressure on grouper and Napoleon res, shark. But even with this protection, yeah, you can see that the corals are recovering. The reefs look very, very healthy, but the fish need probably more time. The coral triangle is at a critical point. Already in 2010, widespread coral bleaching has been reported across the region due to warmer water temperatures. More pressure on fragile ecosystems pushed to the edge by overfishing. Only 0.6% of the world's oceans are designated as marine protected areas. On the Great Barrier Reef, some species populations are 50% higher in protected areas than in reefs open to fishing. Enforcement of laws and marine protected areas are the only way to ensure the seas of Southeast Asia will survive. And to prevent the end of the oceans as we know.